Well, there's still a lot of mystery surrounding what happened that led to the tragic fire in Lahaina. People say many are missing. No one seems to have answers as to why there was no water, why roads were blocked, and why so many lives were lost. The news cycle moves so fast that the people left behind in the tragedy can often get lost in the mix. But our friend, Craig Pastajardula, you'll recognize him from hosting the Jimmy Dore Show while Jimmy's on tour. He recently made a documentary about the people left behind but not forgotten. It's called Lahaina on Fire. Here's the trailer. We finally made it. We're here in Maui. Just a couple miles up the road over there. That's Lahaina Beach. An outrageous fire broke out, killing hundreds, if not thousands, with thousands more missing. They feel that number uh, of 150 people dead is a slap in the face. Thousands are missing. And when they say missing, they just haven't been identified yet. We're going to talk to the citizens, the locals, the indigenous people here at Lahaina to get some answers. They've been telling people, don't come back here. You can't breathe. You can't drink the water. Trying to scare people away. And that seems like they want to have a land grab. And people are very, very suspicious of this. The locals, the, the people who lost everything, those are the ones who are suspicious and they want answers and they're not going to stop. Why did the emergency sirens not get sounded? Why did they run out of water? Why were the police blocking people in so they couldn't escape from the deadly flames? Can you see the fence here? That fence that you got right over there is going ripping all the way around and about so people can't come in through the other side to see what's going on. Uh, they're not allowing anybody in. Unless you have a house that's standing, even the people who lost their houses, they told us yesterday, they're not allowed to go into the zone. So they can't have any closure whatsoever. Why is the governor saying that Maui is closed when the whole island is dependent on tourism? Why are FEMA and Red Cross dragging their feet? At the end of the day, we do know this for sure. The response, the emergency response has been crap. It feels like it's an orchestrated gentrification of sorts. They want people out, they want the locals gone, they want the indigenous people gone, and they want this land. Finally, we're also here to understand what we can do to help these people stay in Lahaina. Lahaina has a history that is rich in tradition. Not just locals lived here, but indigenous people lived in Lahaina. Lahaina was the capital before the American empire had taken over. They're not wanted here anymore that they're not getting the necessary means to stay and fight and live where they've lived for so long. And Lahaina, that is just destroyed, would be a perfect prime spot for them to go, let's just wipe it all out and let's build up from scratch. We need to understand what we need to do as citizens here in America to help these people today. I'm Craig Pasta Jardula. Let's go find out. Greg Pasta Jardula, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us um, what made you want to go to Lahaina and and really examine what was really going on there. The lack of media attention and almost the spitting uh, mirror image of what happened in New Orleans years ago. After that catastrophe of Katrina, it seemed like the mainstream media just packed up and went home while there were still a lot of people left behind with nobody to tell their story or highlight the situation they were going through. I sensed the same thing that was happening in Lahaina. So with the holiday weekend, I just reached out to a lot of my supporters and asked them if they can give me a few bucks to put me on the ground. Uh, grabbed the camera guy, went out there, shot it on up, and expediently put out this uh, beautiful trailer uh, and beautiful documentary. So, yeah, that's what made me go. Yeah, I mean, it looks great. Um, you guys did a really great job. What did you learn from being there? I mean, what 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 was the most shocking thing that you saw while while you were there? Is the place just completely just decimated? Yeah, you know, when you see pictures of it, it, it looks like one thing. But, you know, and I've seen pictures of like Hiroshima and Nagasaki after it was bombed. But to see it with my own eyes and look, wow, that looks almost like a bomb was dropped there, not a fire. Uh, so it was just really, really uh, heart wrenching. Uh, and also too, a lot of the stuff that we had heard, you know, paying attention to what was going on in Maui was confirmed. Uh, I did learn a few other things when I went there, and we were able to express that through the movie. But a lot of the things we we had heard had happened were confirmed when I got on the ground and spoke to the people. Like, what were some of the things? I mean, some of the things that I've heard is still the missing children. I don't know what truth there is to that. Were you able to investigate that? Well, 
that is one part of the reason why we have to go back. Because even though I was there three weeks after the fire itself, it might seem like a long time after, it was still very new and fresh to the people who were dealing with that trauma. So there were a lot of people who weren't ready to speak just yet. In fact, they were holding their head down. They weren't making eye contact. You can see the sorrowness on them. Um, but as far as, you know, the, the children missing, um, I don't know if that is more of a, just a, you know, the, the conspiracy theories of, you know, them getting grabbed and picked up and taken somewhere as to just the whole Hawaiian government, the state government uh, downplaying the tragedy over here, because that is one thing that people have said. That number of 100 dead is a smack in their face. They feel like there's thousands missing. And I talked to several people who felt that way. And unfortunately, a lot of children that were sent home might have, might have just died alone. Yeah, it's just really absolutely tragic. I have some um, family friends, a, a guy that actually graduated with my uncle and is good friends with my dad. And um, him and his wife got caught in the fire in Lahaina. My dad, when he found out about this fire, he says, oh, I know one guy that lives in Maui and I wonder how he's doing. And he went on his Facebook page and discovered that they had got him and his wife had that he was actually at work. And so his wife was at home and she was trying to get the landlady out and her son out and they all got trapped and she ended up surviving, but she had 70% burns all over her body and she was in the hospital for the last couple of months and she did pass away just the other day. So um, really just terrible to have to, you know, the, the tragedy of, of what's gone on there. The people that are, that are surviving there, um, I mean, how are they? How are they holding up? Well, that's the thing, Kim. A lot of people were trying to concentrate on uh, finding a fraudster where they can blow the case on open of why this happened or you know how it happened. A lot of people were concentrating on that. My activist side said, "I want to be able to help the people and highlight their story to keep them there because we know as disaster capitalism happens." Uh, vulture capitalist comes in, you know, there's that disaster capitalism where they grab things and it's a land grab. So for me, it was all about helping these people, highlighting their message, helping the distribution centers and sharing their GoFundMes and gives and goes. And we were able to do that. But these people have a hard time dealing with it. And the number one goal right now is to help them stay on the island. A lot of people have already left. They've already gone to the mainland. They, they, they don't see it. Uh, any reason for them to stick around. They've lost everything. Uh, but there is a group of people that are staying to fight, and I hope that we can help them in their mission. Where are people living? Yeah, that's the, they're, cra they're crammed into hotel rooms. They're crammed into friends' places. Uh, I didn't get to go visit a lot of people where they're staying because they still weren't ready to talk to people. But I heard in a lot of the distribution centers, there was 12 people living in a three-bedroom, you know, eight people living in a two-bedroom, seven people living in a one-bedroom. You see that a lot. And a lot of people were staying in the hotels uh, and the Airbnbs that were picked up from the state with Red Cross or the FEMA program. But now that has ended. So that is why we have to return to Lahaina because there's going to be a lot of people uh, in the streets, uh, if not just leaving Maui and heading to the mainland. So the government was putting up, uh, footing the bill for them to stay in hotels and Airbnbs, and now that's ending this soon? Did they think that their house is just magically yeah. uh, rebuilt in the middle of the yeah. night and that Lahaina is back together? I mean, what in the, why would the government end it right now? Because eventually they want people to leave. They want these distribution centers to shut down so they can open up these beach parks. They want people to go on with their lives. Uh, now, you can try to take a guess on what the motives are and stuff. They are saying that they can, ex have, they can have extended stay for certain people uh, in the, for the Red Cross in their program, but they have to present documentation. Well, guess what, Kim? A lot of the people's documentation burned up in their household. So they have no way of proving that they were actually a citizen of Maui or Lahaina or were staying there and people, you know, who were renting rooms uh, don't have the proper documentation. So it's going to be a struggle. But yes, one of the programs has ended and it's going to be really, really, really tough for people to stay now. Where are people working? I mean, I don't what what was so the entire town, from what I understand, of Lahaina was devastated. So I'm sure that meant not only homes, but businesses. So people were working in those businesses and now they're not. So where are those people working? Yeah. Well, it's a double doozy because when the fire hit, the governor sent a, maybe the wrong signal out there saying that the whole island is closed. 
uh, 80% of the revenue that comes into Maui comes in via tourism. So we drove about two and a half hours away to the other side of the island, a place called Hana, and they were suffering. Uh, they only opened up a lot of their businesses three weeks after the fire. So that is a great question, Kim. Where are people working? Because a lot of people lost their jobs. Their businesses have burnt down. And it really hurt the whole island sending out that message. And that was one of the things we were able to highlight. Mm -hmm. And I was able to highlight through Twitter is that, you know, if you have a trip, plan to Maui, and you were thinking about canceling it, don't cancel it. Still come. Bring your dollars. Help them out. Go to Hana. Go to Paella. Spend time over there. Stay away from Lahaina. Let them heal. But the whole island is open, and they need our help urgently right now. I've, I've witnessed this stuff before with hurricanes in Florida. The hurricane comes. It tears stuff apart. But guess what's due at the end of the month? Rent. And that's just something we have to understand and deal with. Yeah. So the rest of the island, how much of it did you travel to? So you went to Lahaina, but where else in this? In the, in the documentary, do you show the other areas that you went to? Yes, I, I show uh, Hana. I went to Hana, which is the other side of the island. And that island is very, very interesting because uh, West Maui, where Lahaina is, is very dry. But East Maui, where Hana is, is very wet. And in fact, from Lahaina, you can turn around and look at the mountain and see the clouds and the wetness and the dampness over those mountains. So that's the big question is why Lahaina having a fire in 2018? And it was a, a, a big warning to the people there and to the you know, elected officials and the lawmakers to do something about the lack of water that goes to La Lahaina. Because for years, there's been water diversion on Maui. It's not as simple and cut as dry as that the rich areas are getting it. But yes, a lot of waters were diverted away from these towns and sent to golf courses and ritzy areas. So the, the conditions for Lahaina to be, you know, the, a, a prime spot for a fire like this, it was a tinderbox. It, these are it was years in motion to set us up to get us to where we're at today and it's gonna be years in uh in the future before everything is settled it might be two three years before they even ready to break ground there kim it's that bad yeah so i mean it seems like that town is just going to become a ghost town like there will be no line i know you're trying to keep people there but if they're not able to even rebuild for an, another couple of years it just seems like that land will be abandoned well, a lot of people think it will be a 15-minute city because Governor Josh Green, two months before that fire, was the keynote speaker for sustainable cities at the UN and kind of hinted about Maui becoming one of those cities. Uh, cities. And a lot of the citizens know that, and they're aggravated about that and pissed off. Listen, you know, one thing I learned, and I've been to many Latin American countries, socialist countries that have these collective governments where people bond together to fight off a common enemy or obtain a common goal but I've never seen what I witnessed in Lahaina. I mean, the community coming together, helping each other out, the Hollies, the locals, the indigenous, all pulling together their resources to help their neighbors out. And if there's anybody out there who's going to put up a fight to try and stay and uh, stay on their land, it's the people of Lahaina. Uh, I don't know how they can do it, but I'm hoping that we can just help out with direct mutual aid the way I was able to do so by sharing these uh, links of Go, GoFundMe's and Gibson goes, but if they can stay there and find a way and have a say in their future, you know, maybe we can uh, get a victory. Uh, but the whole thing is, is people have to understand what's going on because, you know, a fire came for Lahaina and if we don't get this stuff straight, a fire is going to come for all of us. Yeah. I mean, it's just very, do the people, when you spoke to them, did they all kind of have a similar consensus of what they think happened, what they think went wrong? Or did you just hear a lot of different theories and a lot of different blame? Uh, I, I did hear different theories, right? Um, like I said, I didn't concentrate so much on the fire itself, but everybody, everybody in Lahaina, people who escaped the fire that I talked to, people who lived there were so disgusted with the way the crisis was ha handled in real time. The, it, it was confirmed the water was somehow turned off or not working properly. They haven't gotten a straight answer for that. The police officers yeah. were blocking people in because they thought, you know, wires were down and phone lines were down and it was going to, they were still active when they were not. So people were actually trapped in there and some people were forced to go into the water. People got burnt up in their cars. Um, there were no sirens sounded. Uh, we've heard the story from Tulsi Gabbard before about the missile going. People have told me that story. They were sitting in their bed. The sirens went off. They got something on their phone. 
nothing for this. And when the people were questioned, the emergency manager was questioned, he said he didn't want to sound the alarm because it wasn't made for wildfires. It's mostly used for tsunamis. But guess what? You go to the website, it's right there. It's made for wildfires. Any disaster, they're supposed to sound those sirens, and they did not. People are upset and disgusted by that. And they're not disgusted from their local workers, from the firemen, and the, or even the police officers. They want answers from the higher-ups, and the higher-ups are hiding. They're not being transparent, and that's why it seems like a managed, orchestrated gentrification of sorts. Yeah. Um, so what what um, what are people going to learn from watching this documentary? I mean, it just seems really... I think it's great that you've done this. I think people need to be seeing more and paying more attention to it. You're right. The news has just completely dropped it. You know, the news cycle has completely moved on. What are people going to learn when they watch your documentary? You know, that's a good question because I keep searching for what, you know, what we can do. At the end of the day, I kind of feel like we're hopeless that no matter what happens, the, the ruling class and the uber rich are going to come in and grab the land they want. You know, that's an area where they, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, uh, real estate investors have wanted Lahaina, but people have dug their heels in there. It was once the capital of Hawaii before it was colonized years ago. So, I mean, I, I think that more local community government is going to be important. I think, I hope, hopefully there will be a lot more people showing up at their city councils, understanding how their emergency services work, make sure they're tightened up, make sure they have the right people in place. And if somebody slips to make sure they hold them accountable. Uh, I, like I said, in 2018, there was a fire in Lahaina and this was a, a warning signal. And I don't think enough people got together to make sure they put uber pressure on top of their government to make sure that all the ducks are in a row. So for me, after seeing this film, I would hope that you go to your city council the next day. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a really well done. I, I love that you've done this. Are you going to be making more of these types of documentaries on your channel? I know you've got a new channel, Craig Pasta Jardula. Everybody should check it out. That link is down below. Um, are you? What kind of content are people going to expect from you on your new channel? We've seen you all the time now on Jimmy Dore show um, hosting while he's away and you're doing a really awesome job there, but what are people going to get from you on your, on your channel? Well, you know, uh, with my business partner, Fiorella, you know, uh, doing a lot of things herself, it's really hard for us to connect for a normal show. So a good friend advised me and said, why don't you make more of a hybrid channel, kind of go on the ground over there, uh, get a little Anthony Bourdainish, And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show my personality and I hope it shined uh, through this particular documentary, I wanted to show me and have people kind of live vicariously for me what it's like to go to these places. I have a Nicaraguan video that should be out in a couple weeks uh, that I made before the Lahaina uh, film, but we had to put it aside because we, were, we mm -hmm. wanted to work on this and get it out. So expect to see more travel, me out and about, and then, you know, a couple times sitting behind a desk like this and whatnot. But uh, I think you'll see from my new channel, uh, me getting on boots on the ground and getting out there. But I'm also going to show a lot of people the food I eat, the clothes I buy. I, I wore the show today, a shirt today, Kim, <laughs> because this is the one shirt I bought in the thrift shop in Maui. Uh, so I wanted to wear it for this uh, th this interview today. But I'm going to show a lot more of that personal side of Pasta Jardula. Are you going to show your cooking? Because I think people, maybe they don't know. I mean, the pa pasta's the the name, and it's a name for a reason, because pasta here is a phenomenal chef uh so are you also going to be doing like getting behind the stove and doing some cooking for people maybe yeah i, I think you'll <laughs> see a little bit of that i think yeah, definitely i mean i'm a foodie i love food you know and that's been the most amazing thing too about working with jimmy too he's a foodie i never knew it uh so i think you'll be seeing a lot more cooking a lot more food in me in gen from me in general that i I probably should have shown to all those Latin American countries that I went to before. Well, I'm not going to miss that opportunity this time. So look to see a lot more food from a guy named Pasta. Yeah, I think that's going to be awesome. And I think your your uh, your friend is very wise to tell you to go in that hybrid direction and and showcase more of your personality. I don't know who that friend was, but just yeah. brilliant friend, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Pasta, really, really great having you here. And I, I really, I mean, I'm impressed with this, the, the, this first documentary that you put out. I'm really impressed with the direction you're going with your channel. I think it's really awesome. 
So we wish you all the best of luck and definitely encourage everybody to watch it. Again, that link is down below. Hasta, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kim.